So I have an answer to a question that was raised <coughs> last Sunday uh, morning, but the individual isn't here to hear the answer, so I'm not sure what to do with this. I guess I could give it to you folks and you could let him know. Dick, asked, Dick Cooper asked the question about the armies of heaven. And uh, I did some study, extra study for that. We'll see what happens. We can, we can present it Christmas morning, even though it'll be fine. Okay, we are in Revelation, and we are in the end of chapter 19, ready to go into chapter 20. Not a problem. You go right ahead. Go right ahead, ma'am. Let's begin with prayer together. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have, through your Spirit, prompted us to join together to come to worship and praise you together, Father, with your people. You've come, you've prompted us to come that we might grow in your understanding of your word. Father, that you might continue to equip us to be the people you want us to be. That we might serve you the way you want us to do. And so, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name your blessing upon our time together. May your spirit speak clearly and loudly to us, Father. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that want to receive, Father, the message you have for us. Truly, you are a great and holy God. Lord, we praise and bless your holy name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 19. Let's take a look at the beginning of verse 17, I believe. Chapter 19. I'm not going to spend much time on it because we ended with this portion last time together, last Sunday. We're going to move into chapter 20. John wrote, And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. <clears throat> you, if you haven't read Ezekiel 38 and 9, chapters 38 and 39 recently, they certainly tie into, and this ties into those two chapters in Ezekiel, the Battle of Armageddon. On the plain of Megiddo. Let's go on. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs of, on his behalf. With these signs he de deluded or deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. The beast refers to who? Same. Same. Um, a little more specifically. Sabrina is saying Satan, but the beast actually is referring to, begins with an A. The Antichrist. The Antichrist, yeah. It actually refers to the Antichrist. And that's what it's speaking of here. John saw the beast, the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth. You remember there are ten kings who uh, plug themselves, if you will, into the Antichrist in the last half of the Great Tribulation period. They give all their authority, the kings give all their authority over to the Antichrist. Uh, they become his uh, henchmen, if you will, throughout the world. And John says he saw the Antichrist and the kings of the earth. Uh, they were captured and thrown uh, 
with him the false prophet. The false prophet is none other than who? The false prophet is just that, the false prophet who is the world religious leader during the Great Tribulation period, okay? So you have the world political leader in the Antichrist, you have the world religious leader in the false prophet. Both of them are thrown where and how? Lake of fire. Into the lake of fire. And how is, how is that throwing described? Cast alive. Cast alive into the lake of fire. Notice that they're not killed at this point. Their, their lives, if you will, are not taken, but they're thrown alive into the lake of fire or the lake of sulfur, um, burning sulfur. And it says that the rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds of the air gorged themselves on their flesh. Again, Ezekiel 38, 9, give a little more detail regarding the battle of Armageddon and uh, what's going to be taking place. And I refer you to those two chapters. I'm going to, because it's plugged into this, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer that, to what Dick asked, because maybe some of you are wondering as well. You remember uh, Dick Cooper asked the question, or Carl Cooper goes by Dick as well, uh, how do we know that the, the army of God that's mentioned in <clears throat> verse 19, how do we know that that is us? How do we know that that's referring to the believers, the saints of God, uh, that are going to come down from heaven with Christ? Well, we look at Revelation 19, 14. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So that's the description that brought up the question. We refer to Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Revelation 17, 14. If someone would look for that, look at that for us. We will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. All right, you remember we talked about this a few weeks ago. Who is it that's following Christ according to what we just read? Yeah. The saints. So, all right, who is it that's part of the army of God that's coming down from heaven following Christ? It's the saints of God. Keep in mind how the saints get there. How do the saints get into heaven to be able to come back with Jesus? Accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Yeah, that's the Google of God personal thought, and it's not a very good one. Um, we think of road maps, we think of direct, getting directions, stopping, and I don't know if I ever suggested this to you or not, but if you're ever in a, a community and you're kind of confused, you're not sure where you need to go to get to where you want to go, find a fire department. Find a firehouse, and hopefully there'll be someone there, and there you can get good directions. Why? Why not go to a police station? Fire departments have to know where the streets are. Police do too, but more so firemen than, than policemen. And this comes from an uncle of mine who was a professional fireman in Delaware. They always know or have at least a map and tell you, show you how to get there. Each one, if you'll give me 250 after Sunday school. Uh, I, that's all I'm going to charge for that information. <laughs> anyway, um, through the rapture, through our putting our faith and trust in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the saints of God at the beginning of the tribulation period are going to be raptured or caught up from earth, caught up into heaven to be with the Lord for ever it says, and so we know again that the word of God is telling us those who are going to come back with Christ 
okay, when he returns uh, to put his feet on the earth, they're the saints of God. They are, well, if you want to look around the room, Lord willing, those that are all here this morning are going to be there. They're going to be part of that wonderful return. Let's go a little further. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 11. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 11. Talking about the breaking open of the fifth seal. Who would want to read that for us? When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the, al under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. In verse 11. Then a white robe was given to each of them and was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Alrighty, thank you, Dave. So, what are we reading of here? Who is it that is going to be returning with Christ? Unless we're killed. When? During the tribulation period. Okay, this is the opening of the fifth seal uh, of the judgments of God. And God is saying to them, those who have been martyred, who have given their lives for the faith in Christ, their faith in Christ, they are going to be returning with Christ. They're going to be returning with Christ. Talk about wearing the white robe. It's mentioned in verse 11. They're given a white robe. So <clears throat> you don't have to worry, folks, about going out and buying a special pair of clothes, set of clothes for uh, the rapture. God's going to provide it for you. And he's going to give you a fine linen, clean and white robe to wear. Let's just pause a second. We talk about being sinners yet saints, or sometimes it says saints yet sinners. And when we picture the two terms, a saint and a sinner, the saint we perhaps think of as one, as we're talking here now this morning, wearing a white, clean white linen robe, but as a sinner, what do you picture? Blood stained. Perhaps blood stained. Perhaps, dirty. yeah, bar dirty, unclean. Filthy rags. There goes the white robe. Filthy rags? Yeah. But look at the contrast. We talk about being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Isaiah talks about it as being made what white as though our sins of scarlet. They should become like wool. White. I don't want to bring it up. Snow, snow, snow. snow. Um, do you see the contrast? what Christ is doing for us and has already done for us. Though we are living in decaying bodies, though we are living in sinful bodies and experience it every day, <coughs> folks, there's coming a day when the Lord is going to give us his white robe of righteousness Never again to have to worry about filthy, dirty clothes. Never again. Think of it, ladies. Uh, I'm picking on you, I guess, a little bit this morning, but think of it, ladies. You won't have to worry about having to go to the store and buy Tide or uh, Purex or whatever it might be, uh, Arm & Hammer, whatever you use to wash clothes again because that white robe won't get dirty. 
There are things, some things about heaven that, uh, if I can use the terminology this morning, kind of blow my mind. Never have to worry about cleaning up ever again. Wow. Let's go to chapter 20. Let's go to chapter 20. So who was, who's part of the army of God? Well, it's the saints of God. It may include some of the angels or maybe all of the angels, but if it does, if the army of God that's mentioned here in chapter 19 refers somewhat to the angels as well as the saints, Scripture talks about the myriad of myriad of angels. That's not just five or six. That's, that's a whole host, if you will, of angels. Add that to the saints of God? There's no army that could ever match it. Number-wise, power-wise, authority-wise. And yet, Jesus' army doesn't do a thing but stand behind him and encourage him on, give him worship and praise. Because Jesus speaks a word, a word, and the armies of the world are defeated by that one word. Wow. Let's go to chapter 20. John goes on to say, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Chapter 20 continues the events of Christ's coming and reveals Jesus as the sovereign king who has complete authority and power over Satan, who sets up his millennial reign for a thousand years on the earth. Here in chapter 20, folks, we're going to see verses 1 to 3, Christ as the sovereign king over Satan. Verses 4 to 6, Christ the sovereign king over all. One who delegates his authority. One who has power over the second death. In verses 7 to 10, talking about Christ, the sovereign king, who brings final victory over Satan for all eternity. It's during this thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth that prophecies such as Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, as well as many other prophecies, will be fulfilled. Let's take a quick look at Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Again, if we could have someone read that for us. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. All right, so that can refer to none other than verse 6 refers to none other than who? Jesus. As well as verse 5. Jesus, yeah, exactly. Days are coming, declares the Lord, I will raise up to David's, up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Notice there's no vote taken here. So we don't have to worry about problems with the vote. God's going to do it. God's going to raise up the king. And look how he's described. Part of David's line, he's a right part of David, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Could that be happening today? No, there's a people for full today, can it? With the war going on, with all the tensions of the Middle East, it's a day that's coming in the future. 
this is, his, this is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. A sinless king. A king who will rule justly. A king who will rule wisely. None other than Jesus himself. Let's go back to Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 3. John saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. Speaks of an angel who has been given authority. We see the sovereign king, Christ Jesus himself, gives the command to the angel to do what? Verse 2. Okay, who is he going to throw into the pit? Satan. All righty. So we know that we already have seen the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet, the world religious leader of the end times. Okay, they are already where? In the lake of fire. In the lake of fire. Now, Satan himself, okay, God tells the angel to... Um, capture or seize the dragon, Satan himself, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan. And what happens to this character called Satan? He's thrown into this uh, lake of fire, this judgment of God for a thousand years. The angel carries the key to the bottomless pit or the abyss. This is the home of the demons and the unclean spirits. He's thrown into this uh, abyss, this bottomless pit. The angel carries out a six-fold plan of God. Verses, verse 2, he is called upon by God to seize the dragon. Secondly, in verse 2, he'll bind Satan for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ on the earth. He will cast Satan into the pit or the abyss. Fourthly, he, verse 4, or excuse me, verse 3, he will shut up the pit. He used the key that will lock up the abyss. Again, verse 3, fifth point, he will seal the pit which will render Satan inactive in his work to deceive the nations and uh, number six verse three he will lose Satan again after a thousand years isn't it interesting that Satan is not only locked into the abyss the bottomless pit but God gives this angel a heavy chain to chain over the entrance so that there's no way in the world that Satan can be loosed by himself he can't get out of it. Not only is the door locked, but the, it's chained. It'd be like our locking our entry doors here to the building and getting a, a pretty heavy uh, gauge uh, steel chain wrapping around the handles so that if we try, even try to get out, we couldn't get out. That's what it's going to be with Satan. So this thousand year reign of Christ on the earth is going to be Satan free. Deal. Is the abyss the same as hell? I believe so. I believe so. Go ahead. How come they release you? It's not fair, is it? <laughs> <laughs> he's in the abyss. He's locked in. He's chained in. It's going to be for a thousand years. And uh, we go on a little further. He can no longer, I'm coming to you to answer your question, no longer can he deceive or delude the nations. We know that Jesus himself has given us an understanding of who Satan is. He is called the what? The great deceiver, the father of lies. Yes. So we see that all of his character, all of his work that he's done all these years since he was kicked out of heaven, 
He's not going to be able to do a thing. Where does seat, where'd that come from? Where does deceit originate? Where do lies originate? Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden, yeah. That's, that's uh, where we first start recognizing it, but from whom does it come? Satan, Satan himself. Satan himself, it's, that's his very character, that's who he is. The great deceiver, the father of lies. Isn't it interesting that in our day, as we're moving closer and closer into what we're going to be calling the final seven years of the, of the Great Tribulation period, yet to begin, I believe. I don't think it's started yet. But we're sure seeing it getting closer and closer all the time. We're living in a day of great deception and great lies. From pretty much all levels of government. And people don't do a thing about it. It's just, well, that's who the person is, and you just deal with it. It starts a lot lower than that, the general population. Yeah, well, I think it starts a lot lower than that. Lower level all the way up. Yeah, from the, from the common man, if you will, uh, all the way up to the top. Satan is alive and well right now, and he is working at bringing about his character in the lives of anyone who's willing to buy into it. The great temptation is to be half true. Wow. He's warp speed. Yeah. Well, he's saying he's, Satan's operating at warp speed. Uh, he knows his time is short. I do not believe that Satan has any idea of the when Christ is going to return. But I believe he can sense that it's coming sooner than what we've had all these years. And he is, I believe, working overtime. Notice Satan is not just uh, rendered, or not just simply restricted by what the angel has done to him. He is rendered completely inactive compared to what's going on now. There are those who hold the idea that we're living today in the thousand year reign of Christ. There are some Christians today that really believe that right now we're living in the millennial reign of Jesus. In order for this to be true, we would also have to say that Satan is really bound at this time. That he's not. Go ahead. Exactly. I, I, I don't know. That, I do believe that Satan is bound at this time. We live in a world where exactly what would happen if Satan had absolute control, how bad the world would be. Okay. Can you say that again? I, didn't I said, I, don't, I do believe that Satan is bound, bound at this because. time. Imagine what the world would be like if Satan had complete control of the world and there was no God. Okay, that's is the point I would make. All right, talking about Satan being bound, that, again, according to what we're reading here in Revelation 20, we'd have to say that he can do nothing. Okay, that's what Revelation 20 is saying during this millennium of Christ. Satan cannot do a thing for that thousand years. So to say that he's bound would be inaccurate. To say that he's limited... Yes. We have a sovereign God, don't we? Sovereign means authority, power over all things, all people, all circumstances. Satan cannot do anything unless God permits it to occur. And that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. Okay. So that, I believe, is true, but the aspect of Satan being bound, no, not yet. Not yet. Um, you remember the last temptation you experienced? that didn't come from your own mind, the thoughts came from without, your, your own mind, your own thinking. Yeah, he's alive and well. He's alive and well. But there's coming a day, well, that's going to change. Master. Yes, Phil. Um, the, the 
years that it talks about, the thousand years, do you believe that to be uh, literal or um, a representation of a long period? Sure. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Is that the same saying yes? <laughs> I personally believe, with the study that I've done over the, the years, and I'm only one individual, uh, I really believe it's a thousand year literal reign. Okay. It could refer to a long period of time and not necessarily be a thousand years. Uh, and some very dear and good Christians uh, believe that to be true, that it's not speaking of a, a literal thousand year period, just a, an extended period of time. Um, I've said from the very beginning as we've studied Revelation together now over the last year, uh, from chapter one to where we are now in 20, um, that too often, for whatever reason, I think many are afraid to take Revelation literally. Oh, I hate these things. They're just readers, and I can't go beyond here and look at anything without going, where am I? Um, I believe that Revelation was written uh, so, somewhat symbolically because John had to do that because of what he was going through. Uh, he had been exiled to the island of Patmos. Uh, he was hated by the Roman government, and not only was he hated by the Roman government, the Jews couldn't stand him either because he was a believer in Christ. Um, so I believe it's somewhat symbolic, but again, to the, the principles of biblical interpretation that uh, we're taught in seminary begin with, you first, as you read the Word of God, you have to try to interpret what the Word of God is literally. If it can't be understood literally, then and only then do you move beyond that to say, all right, is it somewhat symbolic, uh, or is it um, that which points to something beyond what it's, it's saying? So when I read Revelation, I read it and say, hey, why not? God could, for a thousand years, have Jesus reigning on the earth. And we with him, as we're going to see. Okay. Um, Yeah, a thousand years is a snap of a finger compared to eternity, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, Second Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, hopefully fill that answer. I'm still coming, coming to the question, answer the question about why does he get loosed again? Okay. Second Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, Paul records that Satan is active in the, in the blinding of the minds of those who hear the gospel. Satan is active in the blinding of the minds of those who hear the gospel. Here it is. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. To pray for the unsaved, that you may know as family members, friends, neighbors, people you work with, to pray that God would open their eyes to see Christ, to open their ears to be able to hear the gospel, and their hearts to become flesh that they might receive the message of God in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, Satan has stopped up the ears of the unsaved. That's why so many people, perhaps you've talked to yourselves, have said, I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me about Jesus. I don't, I'm not going to listen to you. Well, Satan has prompted them to turn you off and to turn the gospel off. Their eyes are blinded. They can't see the light because they're living in darkness. They can't see the light of Christ as given to us in the Word of God. Lord, open their eyes that they can see. Open their under, give them the understanding that they need so that they will want to receive Christ as their Savior because they need Jesus. All of us need Jesus. Don't we? Amen. Okay. Satan not yet bound. Certainly also as the Lord's church moves ahead there will be temptations
to become angry with one another, not in our church. There'll be disputes. The famous five last words of any congregation. We've never done it that way before. And we're not going to start now. The famous last, five last words of the church. We've never done it that way before. Wow. One of the concerns that we all ought to have in the church, in the life of the church, I believe, is that when we are tempted to look at a brother or sister in Christ that we're going to spend eternity with all that time, and we say to ourselves, Ich, I don't want that person. I don't want to become a friend of that person. I don't want to do you know, whatever with, with that individual. Keep in mind that very possibly, wouldn't it be exciting to be a next door neighbor to that person in heaven? Because we'll spend eternity side by side all through. Wow, that'd be exciting. Not. <laughs> Not. Oh my. The Word of God says that we're to consider ourselves better than anybody else, right? Isn't that what the Word of God says? What version is that? That's in Hezekiah 14, <laughs> 31. It's an intertestament book. You probably haven't read it. No, not at all. The Bible says we are to consider others better than us. That says a lot about us. Because we deal with the us all the time, don't we? The attitudes that I'm trying to describe are promoted among us by Satan himself, who would like nothing more than to thwart the work of God among us. We should therefore expect it to come, but to recognize it for what it is and to deal with it openly, quickly, honestly, so that Satan is not able to get a foothold in our lives as individuals or in the life of the church. Several years ago, there was a pastor over in Southern California who the church expanded. They added on to their sanctuary, made a, a, a good, really good-sized sanctuary for a lot of people. And as they did that, and as they remodeled, they put in all brand new carpeting. I mean, it was just beautiful, from what I understand. And it wasn't very long after the congregation got into the building and it started to worship God in the new structure, people came up to the pastor and started to complain, do you see what they're doing to our carpeting? Oh, this, this beautiful color that we have in the sanctuary, they're getting it dirty, they don't, you know, they don't care about bringing coffee in, and there's stains already on the carpet. And he started getting complaints week after week about what people were doing to what this this beautiful carpet. The next Sunday, the pastor decided he got up in the front, started the service, and he made an announcement. He said, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know that for next Sunday, I will be sure that the problem is totally solved. There won't be any more problem at all with the carpeting. And it made the people happy. People were smiling and really looking, anticipating what was coming. They come in the next Sunday and there wasn't an inch of carpeting on the floor. He ripped it all out. It stopped the complaints. It stopped all the complaints. Served a church years ago. It was our first full-time church up in uh, Everett, Washington. We uh, built a new building. The church started out in the basement of a multi-purpose <coughs> building and bought land, put up our first structure. Beautiful, beautiful structure. The uh, 
foreman of, of the building was a, a, an elder in the congregation, we call them deacons here, but an elder in the congregation who was a constr in construction himself, so he knew what he was doing. And when we put in the window frames, they were all clear, solid oak, all the window frames. They were gorgeous. One of the ladies who was married to one of the elders or deacons brought in a gallon of white paint and she was going to paint every window sill. I mean, oh, yeah, window frame inside. And Wayne saw it. You can't do that. This is beautiful oak. But it needs to be painted white. It's in the church. There's a little bit of tension there between this lady and, and Wayne. He was an elder. She was an elder's wife. It's been years since we've been up there to, to see it. But when we left 1978, oh my, there wasn't a drop of paint on this window. <coughs> and they're gorgeous. There could have been a rift in that congregation over the paint on windowsills that could have blown the congregation up. But this lady and this gentleman <coughs> got together, realized what it was they were arguing about, and decided it was better to love one another than to destroy a congregation over paint, or no paint. It's amazing how, as Christians, for me, it's amazing how we as Christians permit really what is small things in the life of our congregations to cause major problems. All because Satan wants to destroy the church. There's that book written, Dr. Carlson, you know, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And he's got another book called Don't Sweat the Big Stuff, too. Susan's talking about Carlson, Carlson was the name? Yeah, Richard Carlson. Richard Carlson's book. Don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's all small. Go ahead, Mr. Richmond. A church we used to go to was a Lutheran church. After we were married, my wife went to circle. And uh, what did they discuss? discuss. They were arguing about how to slice the pickles. For the <laughs> I hope you can hear what he's saying. Can, can all of you hear what he's saying? An argument developing over the slight how to slice pickles. I'm thinking long ways or sideways maybe. I... Della refused to go to her judge. And she drove me out of that church. <coughs> we didn't go to church for a while. Very free Lutheran in the church, where they stress the belief in Jesus, and we never yeah. sound it. Praise God. And so often that happens over these kinds of things. That, again, we served in a, another congregation where uh, I don't remember if ladies had volunteered or if they were asked to prepare for a, a banquet or a special meeting in the church. I'm looking to Annette to see if she remembers. And at least one of the ladies came in after everything had been set out on the tables and decorations. Didn't like it and changed it all. And caused offense to the one who had been asked to do it. Because she did it as best she could. Satan loves to cause wreck havoc in the church. Because he knows he can. He loves to create turmoil within the church where there are people who love one another in Christ as brothers and sisters in the family of God. He loves to do that. He loves to attack God's people because he hates God. And if he can attack the people of God, 
you know, the pastor's wife, you know, like you're saying, Satan interferes with these little things in life, but she said something in a Bible study, Jesus shall reign. I, I'm doing that when things aren't going to, so I said, get out of here, devil. Jesus shall reign. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I could, we could tell you a lot more stories, but we can't do it this morning. I'm going to try to answer your question real quickly because we have to close. The reason why Satan's going to be loosed after the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth, he's going to be loosed to de deceive the nations again. The second battle of Armageddon is going to take place, which is going to lead to the total destruction of the earth. He has to be loosed to deceive the world again, as many as will follow him, so that the second battle of Armageddon will take place, which will destroy the earth as we know it. Second Peter chapter three. Okay? God's gonna destroy the earth with fire. It'll be all burned up. Now the question is, and it might be kind of appropriate to leave it with this this morning, you have people who have lived with Christ on the earth for a thousand years. He has reigned in Jerusalem, King of kings and Lord of lords, for a thousand years. And scripture says Satan's going to be loosed again to what? To deceive people who are living on the earth. You've lived with Christ for a thousand years and you ended up following Satan? How'd it be? How come? Who's going to involve? Next week, the rest of the story. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for bringing us together today. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. And Lord, we thank you that you are a sovereign God. Lord, you are rule over all. You are God. And we bless you in your holy name. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would receive our worship and praise as we enter in together to to bring you just that, our worship and praise. Father, cause us to want to hear your word. Give us, Lord, even in these uh, different, uh, a few moments between the Sunday school and church hour, give us a hunger for your word, Lord. And as Pastor Dan brings the message you've given him for us today, Lord, we'll receive it with open arms, if you will. Open hearts and minds to hear what the word of God declares to your people today. Father, in Jesus' name, amen.